Commodore 1541 disk drive is unique. Not only was it big, slow, tended to overheat, kind of expensive, it also had its own microprocessor and RAM and could do things no other disk drive could really do. Some people even fault the fall of Commodore to this disk drive. Lots and lots of copy protection relied on the intricacies of the disk drive in order to operate. So when new disk drive models came out and improvements were available, manufacturers didn't sell a lot of those devices because the software providers were so used to the 1541. So it's got an interesting history. Here in the United States, they were very popular. I was fortunate enough to have a cassette drive for quite a while. And when I finally got one of these disk drives, it was really awesome. I could now do things I could never do before with cassette. So while these disk drives generate a lot of heat and were prone to heat-related problems, my biggest complaint with this disk drive is just how much it weighed. I would take this to my friend's house, copy some public domain software all night and then go back home you know being 13 years old I put this in my backpack and walked uh, had my friend live closer maybe I wouldn't have been so frustrated with it but walking about a mile and a half each way with this disk drive strapped to my back in the middle of summer was not fun so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this drive apart we are going to weight reduce it we're going to see how light we can get this disk drive and in the process we're going to do something about that heat problem so let's take this guy apart so when I say this disk drive is heavy I'm not kidding so this one here weighs in at a nice oops, at a nice nine pounds seven eight ounces so if you were a kid and you were taking this to your friend's house in your backpack it was a heavy backpack is essentially an RF shield. I am not going to put this back on as part of our weight savings program. So we'll throw that thing to the side here. And here we've got the 6502 which is the CPU as we talked about. The nice thing about this one is everything is socketed. While we have this apart we're going to go ahead and clean it. We'll clean the heads over here. And as part of our weight savings program I'm going to show you what is the heaviest part of this drive. So what I'm doing now is I'm just removing the board to show you what's underneath. And then I'm going to walk through what we're going to do to put this disk drive on a diet. Oops, one more. Okay. This here this connector here is the power supply. We'll remove that, fold this back, and there we go. This is by far and away the heaviest component in this disk drive. Certainly the metal shield is pretty heavy, and I've got some ideas on how to save some weight on this, but we're not going to try those because they get a little bit extreme. What we're going to do is we're going to remove this. This is big, it's bulky, fairly inefficient, and generates an enormous amount of heat. This is a what they would call a linear transformer. Basically takes the power from the wall, converts it over to something that the the uh, circuit board can can ingest and, and do stuff with. So you'll see here there's some uh, voltage regulators and and whatnot, these capacitors. This is all basically the power circuit. This is what converts the wall electricity into something that's you know five volt what, you, what they would call TTL level voltage that runs the rest of the uh, the rest of the electronics and there's also a 12 volt feed in here to run the drive motor but at the end of the day this is great technology but it's very outdated there's a lot better in my opinion ways to do this without the bulk and heat that this thing generates so what we're going to do is we're going to remove this and we're going to rework this power circuit here to be a little bit more efficient these are essentially smoothing capacitors that take the voltage levels and, and smooth them out so that it's a nice clean signal going into the, uh, the rest of the um, logic over here. The thing I don't like about these, and really a lot of the older electrolytic capacitors, is they'll leak. You'll start to see goo come out from the sides. 
if that gets on the board it will start to eat into the board I've got a couple uh, older dish drives different manufacturer over there that have had that problem and then sometimes those can be kind of hairy to fix so what I'm going to do is I'm going to save some weight by removing a lot of these components and also eliminate some future problems by getting rid of these some of these big capacitors as with all my projects I'm going to start by disassembling everything if you don't video your projects especially when you're taking things apart certainly would recommend taking pictures knowing which way these connectors go on um, is really important certainly when they're power related and even and even logic related typically a lot of the Commodore stuff is not what I would call keyed it goes these connectors could go on basically any way you want to put them on and then also sometimes it's really easy to to miss a pin to go to assemble something not realizing that you're one pin over from where you should have been and that can cause all sorts of problems depending on what the connectors are so I'm going to disassemble remove everything possible and give everything a thorough cleaning as you can see down in there there's some something growing it's pretty gross Let's see if I can get a good focus on it yeah I'm not sure what all that is I don't know that I want to find out so we're gonna go take all this out clean whatever that is out and get this to you know a condition that's that's closer to new okay and that essentially is it for the most part it looks like your garden variety dust and and normal things that you would find in a and a piece of electronics that's 40 some years old should be pretty easy to clean out we'll take it to the sink wash it out real good and then we'll bring it back and and get started on it in the event you're going to do one of these projects what I would always recommend as you know is complete disassembly so taking this guy out is something that I would absolutely do typically there's a ring on the back sometimes they're glued or melted on sometimes they're screwed on they're slightly threaded I've seen a lot of different ways to get these out. If you end up breaking this connector or this what they call LED holder, um, there's a lot of places online where you can find them. These are generally five millimeter LEDs and the parts are fairly easy to find, but I definitely would recommend taking this out just to get it out of the way. One other piece of note on this disk drive. If you have one that needs retro brighting, you'll notice the logo here. What I found is this logo must be made of a slightly different plastic than this. Every time I've retro a 1541 with the snap-in logo, and this logo here, as you can see, snaps in, I've seen it would come out a slightly different color. So here they match pretty well. If I retro this for any amount of time, I think you would find this will not match as closely when we're done. So, if you're going to do that, you can certainly try to take these out. I've broken a number of those as well, trying to get them out. But if you're going to go to the retro bright route, just be aware that that is a slightly different, I believe, a slightly different type of plastic, and you're going to end up with some, some mixed results if you do that. We're not going to retro bright this one. It really honestly doesn't need it. I think the, the gain would be minimal. I don't know that there's much to be had from retro brighting it. But in the event that you do, just be aware of that. Depending on how much time you have, this is a modification that you could honestly make in a couple hours if you're if you're good with a soldering iron first thing is let's unscrew the transformer get it out of the way There we go. Now, what I typically do is I try to cut these wires back as far as I can. That way, I have plenty of plenty of room to work with. Certainly, uh, your mileage may vary depending on what you're going to do. But I'm going to cut these wires as far back as I can because we are never going to use this transformer again the red wire obviously is not connected that 
that's fine. There we go. Now for fun, let's get an idea how much weight we're going to save just by getting rid of this. So you can see this is about 2 pounds 9 ounces just in this one component. What we're going to put in to replace it is significantly lighter and I'll show you that here in just a minute. I filed that transformer. Let's go ahead and remove this disk drive. This is not really necessary to remove the drive to do this mod. However, I'm going to clean it really good and some of the heads on these drives you know they're getting pretty old and I see a lot of head failure so I'm just going to get it out of the way just really for safety's sake if for no other reason. Okay now let me show you what we're going to replace that large linear transformer with. And you'll see that we are much better shape so we're going from two pounds and some odd ounces to well less than a pound. So about 13 ounces. This is a mean well. Oops, here we go. This is a mean well RT50B power supply. Turns out it supplies the 5 volts and the 12 volts that we want. I can mount this down there where that linear transformer was, wire it up, and we're in good shape. So recall that this is largely the way everything is going to mount. All these guys are going to come up, plug into here. So mounting that power supply somewhere right in here would be pretty good. It turns out this power supply does not have holes that line up conveniently, so I'm going to have to drill a hole, but that's okay. So I'm going to put two screws right there, one on the bottom and then one up against the sidewall here. So I'm going to drill two small holes and then bolt that in so it's got a nice solid connection and it's not going to bounce around anywhere. So I'm going to take a, a sharpie and I'm going to put little dots on those holes and then I'm going to drill them out. So I'm going to go ahead and get the wires connected since it's a tight fit so I can get the ends on there, get them screwed in and then we'll bolt the power supply in place to the chassis here at the end. So green wires ground black wire is load, white wire is neutral. Since I don't know who in the future may be opening this up and, and unhooking things or whatever else, you can see the, the back of the power supply here. I'm going to go ahead and label the wires where they go so there's no question you know, in the future where these things are connected to. So I'm going to use my label maker and just label these wires and then put some connections. Since these other connectors here are pretty easily accessible and not squished up with all the wires, I'm going to go ahead and mount the power supply right there. So here's the power connector that we cut off. This comes from the transformer up to the circuit board. And essentially what the transformer does is step down the voltage to something that's uh, consumable by the power circuits here. And then we've got some voltage rectifiers that basically turn that sine wave and invert the uh, the bottom half of it and then we've got some other components here that smooth that out and eventually give us a smooth 5 volts and a smooth 12 volts. So we've got some voltage regulators and smoothing capacitors that do all that stuff. So what we're putting in is a switching power supply. The switching power supply generally provides a pretty clean 12 volt signal and a pretty clean 5 volt signal so we really don't need a lot of this stuff. But I want to reuse as much as we can from this and so I'm going to reuse this power connector I'm going to put the appropriate ends on it, connect it up to the new switching power supply, and bring that up and just plug it into the same port that we had on the circuit board original, originally. Now, the trick of course is that we're going to remove a lot of these components and they won't be there anymore, and so we're going to have to decide which pin goes to which voltage and basically make some jumper wires to kind of connect things the way they need to be connected. So we'll show you on the schematic exactly how that looks. But essentially what we're going to do is remove most everything that doesn't need to be here, knowing that a lot of those components have been moved into the switching power supply, and put the right, you know, put the connectors on the right wires. We'll label the wires, of course, and then plug it in here. So here's how we're going to solve 
the problem of the connector getting plugged in the wrong way. So what I did was I pulled out one of the wires and on the end of this I'm going to plug the hole with some hot glue and then also remove the pin from the uh, circuit board down here. That way it can only really go in one way. It'll be keyed like you've seen on lots and lots of other connectors. Um, there's some other, a couple other ways we could have done it. I've never actually tried it this way before so this will be kind of a new, a new experiment. I will mark it of course which way I, it is designed to go but then the the keying, if you will, will make it a little bit better. In, in other words, it'll be physically impossible to plug this in the wrong way. Let's see if we can get some focus. It'll be physically impossible to plug it in the wrong way because I'm going to fill that extra hole there where that pin is with some hot glue so it just can't go the wrong way. All right, hot glue is probably one of my least favorite things to work with because it just gets everywhere. However, super handy to have. So what I've done is I have filled up from one end to the other that hole on the connector. And I will get you zoomed in here. So if you can see, I filled it from the bottom all the way to the top. You might be able to see it coming out right there. And so, this is now officially a three-prong or three-hole connector. And it's keyed such that it can't be put in backwards. What you see here is the original schematic for the power circuitry in this disk drive. We have the transformer T1, which is the big transformer we threw in the trash a little bit earlier. And what we have is what you see here now. We, in orange, we have a switch mode power supply that we've put in place. But now that that switch mode power supply is there, a lot of the cir circuitry to the right really doesn't need to be, in, be there anymore. There's no need for the bridge rectifiers, CR1 and CR3, and there's really no need for the voltage regulators, uh, VR1 and VR2. The capacitors and the diodes there, all of that is really taken to, into account in the, into the switch mode power supply so we can really get rid of all of that and make it look like what you see here. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to remove all those components, install a jumper or two to make this schematic what is on that board. Okay so based on the schematic we know what we can remove. There is one small issue but it's not really much of an issue and that's these voltage regulators here with the heat sinks around them. The one of the heat sink is actually used to screw into the chassis, as you may recall when we took it apart, and that's right here. In experience, and I've done a number of these, removing this is okay. Yes, the board isn't quite as stable, but you've got two screw holes right here, which really anchor the serial connection really well. So I'm going to go ahead and take this off. This is a weight saving exercise, so we're going to get rid of the extra stuff that we really don't need. And you'll see when we get done here, it really isn't going to impact anything at all. Um, it's going to be perfectly safe to do that. So let's go ahead and start removing some things. Okay. That is about it. We've removed all the components we identified in the schematic that really aren't necessary. Really the only things left to do is do a couple jumper wires from here to the proper entry points into the rest of the circuit and fire it up and see if it works. So here we have all the components removed and jumpers coming from the appropriate places from the power connector. So recall that we have a 12 volt, a 5 volt, and a ground wire and we plugged the third so that it only goes in one way so it's keyed if you will so this wire can only go in that way notice that the heat sink has been removed and so the board is a little floppy there I haven't put all the screws in it yet but that's okay because we're here this is all going to be in the case there'll be a screw here and the serial connections are very well connected and very very sturdy so basically I removed everything that wasn't necessary as we saw in the schematic so these jumpers basically just are jumpering these connections over to the appropriate places. So here we have the 12 volt connection coming from here. So there's a solder trace that connects to there. Then from here to here is the 5 volt connection. 
that's this guy right here. So these are uh, voltage rectifiers into the voltage regulators. And then we have a ground. And so if you can see right there, there is a small jumper between pin, uh, I guess it would be pin three and four there, that jumpers into the ground connection which goes across the entire board. So before I power it on, I'm going to go ahead and double check with the uh, continuity check tester to make sure that these go to the right places. I'm 99% sure they do because I was pretty cautious as I made them, but I like to double check. So I will double check the continuity, make sure everything goes where it should. As you'll recall from the schematic, this 5 volt connection basically goes to anything else on the board that uses 5 volts. So all these ICs should have continuity with this wire right here. So I can go from here to all the VCC pins on all the chips and we should get continuity. Okay, so I've got the continuity checker here. You'll hear that sound anytime the, there's a connection between these two. And that's what we should get. So if there's 5 volts, if there's continuity between this connection point here and that chip, that means any other place with 5 volts is also going to have that same, that same connection. So there we go. I'll go ahead and test ground. So ground should beep. So those are good, and I know from inspection that this is going to the 12 volt, which powers the motor on the disk drive. So, based on that, I think we're ready to turn it on. Okay, I'm going to hit the power switch for the very first time, and we should see the drive light come on. Stay on for a couple seconds, and then power off as the um, microprocessor and the programming, the ROMs, and why not go through the power-up sequence. That looks very good. That's what I expect. Let's do it one more time just for kicks. Great. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get a computer. We'll plug the computer in, test out the disk drive from an operational perspective. Before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and clean the head. The heads are, or I should say head. This is a Commodore 1541. There's only one head. All right, well... If you look down, the head is actually on the bottom. So when you put a floppy disk in, the data is actually coming off the underside of the disk, even though the label is on the top side of the disk. So what we'll do is, actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just pull the board off. We're going to lubricate and clean the heads real quick while we've got it apart. And then we'll plug it into a 64, run a few tests, play a couple games. And if all those go well, we'll put it back together and we'll weigh this weight reduce Commodore uh, 1541 and we'll see what it weighs. I'm going to go for broke with the testing here and pop in one of my favorite games I was never very good at Rocket Ranger. So we're going to put Rocket Ranger in fire it up. I'm pretty confident this is going to work so let's see what we get Drive motor is spinning, indicates 12 volts is working great, and we have a game. All right, I think we're in pretty good shape. Okay, everything seems to be looking good. So I would say we have a nice, functioning, cooler, and much lighter 1541 disk drive. So let's do a final weigh-in. And our final weigh-in is six, about 6.9 ounces. Not too bad. I know what you're thinking. Wait, you forgot to put the power LED back in. You're right. And you're wrong. I didn't forget to put the power LED back in. That is the subject of our next video. We're going to do some customizations to that LED. 
it makes things a little bit more interesting and actually a bit more useful. Stay tuned. And here are the parts that we removed from the 1541 disk drive. Aside from the transformer which I threw in the trash and didn't want to dig back out. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll come hang out with us in the Commodore room again real soon.